Welcome everyone to this hands-on workshop on parametric studies for rotating machinery with SimScale. I'm Kanchan Kar, Product Manager for Rotating Machinery at SimScale, and I will be your host today. Joining me today is my colleague, Matt Bemis. He'll be your instructor for the hands-on workshop. Matt is an application engineer at SimScale and is currently based in Boston. So without further ado, let's dive in and take a look at the agenda for today. And before we proceed any further, just a quick reminder that all mics will remain on mute during the presentation. Should you have any questions or face any technical difficulties, please feel free to reach out to our workshop administrator using the live chat option. As some of you might already know, last year we launched our proprietary technology for rotating missionary simulations. And staying true to our vision, we continue to invest in making fast and accurate simulation accessible to this industry across a wide range of applications. Our proprietary technology is indeed an end-to-end -end solution with built-in geometry and meshing, multidisciplinary analysis, and post-processing. The fact that SimScale is a browser-based tool means that it can literally be accessed from anywhere, anytime, and at any scale. And of course, we understand that it needs to be economical for it to be truly accessible. And we address this by minimizing IT and licensing costs through usage-based pricing and HPC orchestration. Moreover, companies can also leverage our API functionality for custom and seamless integration with existing tools, bringing them a step closer to full organizational digitalization. A huge part of SimScale's commitment to this industry has been our investment in proprietary technology that is specifically designed for rotating machinery applications. Along with lots of in-house validations, we have had a number of companies successfully use our technology, which has added to the rich database of validations and benchmarks. We have consistently achieved an accuracy of nearly 2 to 3% error margin of experiments. And the fact that we are a cloud-native technology means that we are one of the fastest solutions on the market with the unique capability to run multiple operating points concurrently on the cloud to generate a full performance curve in just about 15 minutes. And that is what you see here is a performance curve for a pump, which took just 15 minutes to generate. And this is the main feature that Matt will be covering in the workshop, as you will see later. In keeping with our multi multidisciplinary approach, we are continuing to invest in CFD, structural analysis, as well as thermal analysis, with the aim of enabling companies to maximize the value of simulation early in the design process, as well as throughout the product's life cycle. And these are some of the applications that you can see here for which you can use SimScale. Uh, this is the most exciting part for me as the product manager talking about the product. I am excited to announce that we have released transient analysis capability within our rotating machinery solver. This capability is actually available to you as part of your professional trial of the workshop. And I and Matt will talk about it a little bit more later as we do the demo. Meanwhile, uh, let's take a look at the other advanced physics capabilities that you can expect in the short term. We are, for example, working on local mesh refinement, which is expected to yield further improvements in solution accuracy and speed. Cavitation modeling, which is crucial for pump design, is also going to be available early next quarter. And looking ahead in the year, users will soon be able to simulate real gas behavior, multi-phase, and the motion of discrete particles in rotating machinery applications. We are also fortifying our multidisciplinary approach by focusing on structural modeling enhancements and parametric design optimizations. And through all this, we are working and we will continue to work in streamlining and automating the simulation workflow because we truly believe that along with the simulation runtime, your time as the user, as the engineer or analyst using the tool is also very, very valuable. And it should not be uh, 
spent in navigating menus or troubleshooting simulations. Rather, it should be spent in simulating and iterating on your designs. Some of the improvements and features that you can expect along these lines is automations of the rotating region creation and custom calculator in the post processor. So as promised, we will discuss in detail the cloud native transient analysis for rotating machinery. What you see here is uh, the transient flow results for a centrifugal pump. And to show you the simulation setup, as well as the theoretical background, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Matt, who is going to take you into the demo, followed by a hands-on workshop. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Kanchan. All right, so as Kanchan mentioned, I'm going to do a couple things here, starting with giving you a little information around our rotating machinery transient technology and how we uh, built it. So we are using a sliding mesh technique, which is used to develop or, or give you time accurate rotating geometry solutions. Our proprietary technology fully automates the meshing of the sliding interface, which allows us to generate meshes that yield highly accurate results, typically again within two to 3% margin of experimental data. Setting up a transient analysis in SimScale is as easy as turning the uh, time dependency from steady state to transient. So really just with a flip of a switch, you can run a transient analysis. Again, because this is a cloud native implementation, it makes it possible to obtain fully transient solutions for either a single data point or an entire set, so a performance curve, in just a matter of a few hours. We can see on the graph here, we are actually yielding a slightly uh, increase in accuracy due to the transient simulation runs. So this is really necessary, um, maybe not all the time, but maybe as a last pass after you've already run a steady state analysis. So I'd like to just give you an overview of the demonstration case I'm going to show you today. We will be doing two different things here. So first, I'll show you a demonstration of our transient capabilities, and I will walk through that myself. Next, we for the hands-on workshop section, we will actually, together as sort of a, a team here, uh, build a experimental case which develops a steady state but full, full uh, flow head curve. So we call it an experiment. We'll run multiple operating conditions at once and get an entire uh, performance curve in, in about 10 minutes. Just to go over some of the operating conditions here. So we set up the centrifugal pump by defining one atmosphere absolute total pressure at the inlet. 60 cubic meters per hour at the outlet. This impeller is rotating at 2,900 RPM. And just a few more details because this is transient. So we're running this for four revolutions. I just developed the end time based on a speed of the, um, uh, of the impeller. I'm using three degrees per time step. So typically, we want to use a, a time step which makes sure there is not too much rotation at the interface um, of, of the sliding mesh. Three degrees is a great starting point. It's a good balance between getting a result quite quickly while also making sure your results are accurate. Lastly, I'm saving out every 18 degrees. So we don't need to save every three. That's a lot of data. Um, every 18 will still allow us to see sort of the, the phenomena or what's going on um, in the simulation uh, with just keeping keeping the save interval a, a bit coarser. This is, of course, a fully turbulent simulation, and I'm using water for the material. I do just want to touch on one last thing here. So the four revolutions, uh, SimScale set up intelligently to make sure you get past transient effects or, or ramp up effects. So if you actually try to set an end time, which is less than the, uh, say, three revolutions, will give, give you a, a warning. I chose four just to be a bit more conservative. So let's not uh, wait any further. I'm going to jump into the transient analysis and show you a demonstration of our capabilities. Now I'm going to step you through how you can use SimScale to analyze the transient effects of a centrifugal pump. 
I've already run this analysis and we are about to look at some results. But before I do that, I just want to point out that this is the SimScale workbench. It's where I will be doing all the visualization of the results. And I'm just in a Firefox browser. So there's a URL at the top of the screen. We usually say as long as you have a, a decent laptop and access to internet, you can run high fidelity simulations. So a little bit of background of what we're looking at. This is a centrifugal pump and the fluid is water. I've run this transient analysis for four revolutions and I'm using a time step such that each uh, time step is roughly three degrees of rotation. Now I'm going to show you an animation here and you will see more than that. So each frame I've actually saved is, is at 18 degree increments. So you'll notice uh, it's a bit of a bigger step between the, the animation. We're looking at velocity here. Again, this is four rotations of, of transient analysis. And the primary reason I ran this analysis is to understand effects which could not be picked up in a steady state simulation, or steady state approximation of this simulation. So here we can see velocity on this cutting plane. And there's a few very interesting effects that uh, could not be captured in a steady state simulation. The first one really is sort of this low velocity uh, section which sticks around at the end of the impeller geometry. You'll notice this essentially at every one of the blades going around here. Ultimately it does sort of as as the flow uh, leaves the the rotating zone and heads towards the discharge area it does sort of disperse but we can see very distinctly that this uh, follows the blade geometry. This is the exact type of thing which could not be picked up in a steady state simulation. If I wanted to understand sort of the gradient here at any point I can inspect and get a velocity uh, exact velocity data point. Now this animation can be written out both as an mp4 uh, file format or as a GIF. Now that you understand what types of results you can get out of SimScale, let's jump into the setup and I'll show you how I set up this model. The first step is getting your CAD into SimScale. We support and work with every major CAD package. And of course, we also support the CAD neutral formats like STEP, SAT, or Parasolid. I already have my geometry in here. And there's really only two parts to this geometry. So first of all, there's the solid volume. And this includes where the blade geometry is. We have a void, right? I also have an oversized MR rotating zone. So here I actually had to oversize it and come outside of the domain just to sort of uh, fit it in. That is OK. We will not consider um, anywhere where there is not the volume or the fluid that will not be part of the domain. So it's okay to oversize your rotating zone. In this case, um, no issue. So I have my geometry here. Now we need to choose what types of physics we're going to do. I'm going to use our subsonic analysis type. This is the analysis type which is specifically developed for rotating machinery applications. Now you'll notice there's a series of green checkboxes and red circles on the side here. So SimScale sets you up and tries to uh, let you know where there is missing information. And the general workflow is working top to bottom. Ultimately, we're trying to get the simulation runs where we can kick off the analysis. Now the default time dependency is steady state. However, what I'm going to show you today is a transient analysis. I, you saw the transient results, so of course that's going to flip to transient. For materials, we are just using standard water. You can define your own material properties if you would like, so you can bring in uh, your own material properties. However, for now, I'll just use water. The boundary condition pairing we do is really a total pressure uh, fixed value at the, at the inlet. So total pressure in a uh, zero gauge. And on the outlet, we use a volumetric flow rate. 
And I'm going to be using about um, 1.6 e to the minus 2 cubic meters per second. So our boundary conditions are, are done. Now we need to define the rotating zone. I'm just selecting the MRF zone and referencing the Cartesian coordinate system in the lower right corner. This does rotate about the Z. It does rotate about the origin. And I'm using uh, 303 radians per second. That's about 2900 RPM. You'll notice at this point I have green checkboxes down the entire model, so I could kick it off. There's no missing information. However, there are some optional result quantities which I would like to set up to really get that nitty gritty data out of SimScale for analysis. Under result controls, I'm interested in the forces and moments, and I'm going to select all the blade surfaces. So this will write out a, uh, a graph showing me power, torque and other result quantities for the rotating um, for the surfaces inside the rotating zones. Next I'm interested in the pressure difference so we automatically set up this result control and we give you a, um, a static pressure delta as a graph. I've selected my inlet face and outlet face so I'm all set here. Now, because this is a transient analysis, I need to uh, specify a couple items here in order to um, correctly run this analysis. So first things first, um, we need to determine an appropriate end time. It's generally a best practice to run the transient analysis for at least three rotations based on RPM. What I actually ended up doing is I'm going to use a bit over uh, eight hundredths of a second. This will allow full, four full rotations, so it's even a little more conservative. We will definitely get past the ramp up area, um, which is, which is a, exactly our goal. The number of iterations is important to note. These are sometimes called either sub iterations or inner iterations. All this is saying is for each global time step, we run sort of 25, we could call it quasi steady state or, or steady state um, iterations. We are trying to achieve um, convergence at each individual iteration. And uh, please note that just because you specify 25 here, which is the default, it's, I think it's an appropriate default, we can leave it for now. But it doesn't mean all 25 of those um, will be uh, run or iterated. We, once we hit the convergence criteria, we actually move on to the next global time step. So I'll leave that for now as is. I did mention earlier that in terms of develop or understanding a, an appropriate delta T, we usually start with a delta T which will result in three degrees per time step. So I just did a quick uh, hand calculation and we end up at about 1.7 E minus four seconds. Again, three degrees per time step will get you, um, so that's 120 uh, time steps per revolution. Ultimately, we need to uh, make sure our time step is small enough such that we don't miss any transient effects and it, it doesn't impact our results. Now, the right interval is just how, how many time steps uh, would you like to save uh, as a result set? I'm actually going to save every 18 degrees and we know each delta T is three degrees. So I'm going to set this to six. So every six time steps, I want to save out a set of results. Now the maximum run time is just wall clock time um, in which the simulation will run to. If it hits this limit, it will be canceled. These run much, much faster than that. So I don't expect this to be an issue. And I'm going to leave the convergence criteria as a default. So at this point, we can go ahead and submit the analysis for solve. There's a couple warnings, however, these are just warnings, not errors. Uh, we see a yellow um, message here. So I'm going to run anyway. I'll call this demo and start the analysis. Now again, because SimScale is cloud-based, we can run as many simulations at a time as we want. So for instance, if I wanted to understand how it would perform with, say, without water, but actually with an oil, 
I can actually just select oil from our default material database, go ahead and assign, and kick off the analysis. So it doesn't matter whether you are running uh, one analysis or 20 or 50, you will get your results back in that same very quick run. Um, so that's what I wanted to show you here. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. All right, now that I gave you a demonstration of the transient analysis, it's time to jump into the work, workshop session of this, which is hands-on, and uh, step you through how to set up a, exper a simulation experiment in some scale um, for turbo machinery step-by-step um, -step here. Now, everybody ahead of time got a link to this project called Centrifugal Pump Rotating Machinery Workshop uh, for February 16th. The first thing to notice here is you need to make a copy of the project. So right now, um, Kanchan actually owns this, the master copy. Usually when I do these workshops, folks get mostly hung up on the fact if they come in here and say, oh, um, everything is grayed out. In other words, it looks like you are in, or, or what's the problem is, you are actually in, in um, a view only mode. So up top here, I'm going to copy the project Give it any name uh, that you may like, and just follow along here. And we'll work through this project together, um, editing. You'll notice, just like we've done previously, there are a set of milestones. So if you get stuck or get lost in a certain section, you will not be sort of out of luck and, and just completely lost. We really ha set these up so you can sort of continue on and, and follow if you, if you run into issues. So we've got nine milestones and two geometries. The way this is really set up is each item covers um, or, or, or each milestone mentions what's already been done. So for instance, milestone three, boundary conditions are defined, means we've correctly set up the boundary conditions here in case uh, you run into issues there. The first step will be selecting pump for simulation. A couple items here. So first of all, there's two geometries, the fluid uh, domain, which is really the volume here, and I will just isolate this. And we also have an MRF, uh, a rotating zone, I should say. Just to uh, sort of comment for one moment on our, on our fluid domain, we see a void where the blade geometry is. If I show our rotating zone, it is oversized, just that's kind of how we had to the size it in CAD. However, um, any rotating geometry which is outside the fluid domain here is not considered part of, the, part of the domain. We've also set up a couple topological entity sets. So for instance, we ahead of time selected the surfaces which represent the blade and uh, set this as, as a blade topo set. We've done the same for the inlet and outlet and we will leverage those as we move through this uh, simulation. So to start, uh, go ahead and select the pump for simulation geometry and select create simulation. This is where we have to choose what types of physics we will analyze. We will be using our subsonic analysis type. Again, this is targeted specifically for rotating machinery and it's really set up to uh, help a designer or a pump engineer very quickly and efficiently set up a pump simulation or simulations. So just because we, we can, I'll go ahead and say create simulation here. Give this a, a name whenever you would like. We're not really gonna do anything else uh, below here. We're actually gonna go up to, to milestone one. So go ahead and expand milestone one. We see here, this is a subsonic analysis type. We're running at a steady state and it's turbulent. The first step we're going to do is actually assign uh, our materials. So we're using water here, and we have default water. Please select this from our default material database and just left click to select um, the uh, domain here. There's no need to select uh, the rotating uh, zone. We will define this later on. Select the checkbox, and at this point, milestone one is actually completed. Moving, let's go ahead and expand milestone two. 
we see here, uh, in case for some reason you ran into issues, we've already defined water here. And next, we need to work on boundary conditions. So again, the boundary condition set we will be working with is a pressure at the inlet and a flow rate at the outlet. So if we select pressure inlet, and we actually do need to make a change here. Instead of the pressure type being fixed value, which implies static pressure, we actually need to flip this to total pressure. So total gauge pressure of zero pascals is fine. Go ahead and just select OK here. Next, uh, here's where things get a bit more interesting. We'll be using a velocity outlet. And we'll go ahead and just select the outlet here. Instead of a mass flow rate, we're going to use a volumetric flow rate. And instead of selecting a single value or defining a single value here, let's go ahead and select this, this graph item here. So here we're actually going to define a table of flow rates. So I'm going to start um, with six thousandths of a cubic meter per second. And you can kind of just follow along. Um, next, we're up to eight thousandths. After that, we're at one hundredth of a cubic meter per second. Then we're up to twelve thousandths, fourteen thousandths, sixteen thousandths, and eighteen thousandths. So, of course, we're starting, a, we essentially defined the lowest flow rate as um, row one, the highest is row seven. And it, this is actually going to tell SimScale this is now an experiment. It's not just a single simulation run. It's going to run all of them for you automatically. So under flow rate, it actually says parameterize now. And when we kick off the analysis, it'll kick off all of those. Um, let me actually just pause for a moment here because folks may have missed the, the table. So I'm going to leave that up for about 10 seconds. And if you're running into issues, please let me know um, or write in in the chat and we can, we can help you out. Actually, Matt, while you've got that pause there, um, hi, everyone. I'm Steve. I'm helping in the background. There's a question here that I think would be worth addressing to everybody um, just while you let everyone catch up. Someone has asked um, about the flow volume. They said that they understand that the volume of the volute is made of water, uh, representing the water flowing through the geometry. But what about the rotor and blades? Um, are they solid? And how is the rotating zone overlapping with them? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Um... I'm going to assume everyone here, it, it would help to look at it. So I'm going to assume everyone here is, is all set with that table. So uh, yeah, a little background about the, the volute and how we extracted the flow volume. So when you are bringing a, or, or when you're ready to run a simulation, a rotating geometry simulation in SimScale, there simply needs to be two items. There needs to be a, a fluid domain, which we see here in gray, and there needs to be a rotating zone. In terms of uh, the, the blade geometry, um, and sh is that solid? If I were to actually show this as a cross-section in CAD, um, it, it's just a void. So it's not part of the domain. It's not part of the system. Um, you can actually think of if, if we were to do a, a CAD flow volume extraction, we would just have a, a flow volume cut with the blade geometry, get rid of the blades. It would be void. And then the rotating zone actually sits on top of the uh, flow domain here or, or flow domain body. So it actually interferes with it, sits on top of it. Why that is necessary is SimScale needs to see that there is inside the rotating zone, there is a flow volume. Steve, does that cover your question? Yes, I think that adequately covers it. Thank you, Matt. Great. So um, there's one last thing we have to do here. So because the rotating zone actually comes out of the, the, the domain here, we actually do need to uh, apply a no slip boundary condition uh, to the external walls. So let's go ahead and add a wall boundary condition. The standard uh, type for velocity is no slip. That's perfect. 
And we're going to select the outside walls. There's four total surfaces here. It's actually every surface on the um, of in the flow domain except for the inlet and outlet faces. So again, this is a wall no slip. Um, at this point, we've defined all the boundary conditions. So moving to milestone three, again, notice the, the trend kind of continues. All the boundary conditions are here. We need to define the rotating zone. Under advanced concepts, we have our rotating zones. And uh, we're going to click the uh, blue volume to define this, uh, this rotating zone here. Now, a couple items to notice here. The axis, the defaults to rotating about the z-axis. It, um, I've centered my assembly about the origin, and the origin of SimScale is the same as your CAD package, so that kind of makes life easy. And um, we're using the right-hand rule here, so if I were to think of a, uh, in the positive Z sort of vector direction, and if we look here, this just means the um, rotating zone is rotating in the counterclockwise direction. That's in fact how it operates, so we'll go ahead and leave that as a default. This is rotating at 303.7 radians per second. That's also the, the same as 2,900 RPM. So um, let's go ahead and go to milestone four. And, and I just kind of want to pause here and, and take a moment. So at this point, we can actually kick off the analysis. We see green checkboxes the whole way down. There's no missing information. If we wanted to, we could actually go to simulation run kick off the analysis. Now, that being said, uh, to actually get the data that we really want to extract and, and, and analyze the simulation for, I'm actually going to spend some time and set up optional result quantities so we can get a lot of analytical data out of SimScale, which may not be there as a default. So the first step is under result controls. Let's go ahead and add a forces and moments result control. And um, to make this just a bit easier, we're actually going to select the blade topological entity set that sits over on the right side under geometry. So I made this ahead of time just to make life a bit easier. All we're doing here is selecting all the uh, blade surfaces or, or really the interface of the blade surface in the fluid domain. And I'm interested in the forces and moments because this will tell me torque on the impeller, uh, power, and other result quantities. Again, the center of rotation is zero. Uh, um, moving to milestone five, I'm going to add um, a surface data area average. So what this does is, for instance, we'll, we'll go ahead and select both the inlet and outlet face. And this is going to write out all the data you may want um, for each of these phases. So it's going to average it. So for instance, velocity in the X, Y, Z, or velocity magnitude, uh, pressure, both static and total pressure, mass flow rate, turbulence quantities, and a few other items. And actually just moving to milestone six, um, we've actually sort of, we know folks are interested in the pressure difference. So we actually, tailored a, a custom result con uh, control. Um, and if we go ahead and add another surface data item here, there's an option for pressure difference. And this is ultimately how we are going to get the uh, flow head graphs. So assign the inlet face. And next, we have to select here and assign the outlet face. SimScale will automatically uh, calculate the static pressure delta across these two and uh, develop a graph for you. Now, at this point, uh, Milestone 7 just have, has that done for you in case you ran into issues. Uh, milestone 8 will go ahead and kick off the analysis. So just to kind of um, take a moment to, to cover these items, we see there's both the area average and, and the pressure difference. Um, we see the flow rate is parameterized. We're all set to go. So let's go ahead and under simulation run, please, uh, with me, go ahead and kick off uh, experiment 1. You can name this whatever you'd like. Let's select start, and we'll go ahead and uh, kick off a bunch of simulations together. 
just a couple items to, to kind of go over here. Um, you'll notice this sort of this we we have the experiment one, but then below it there are all the subsequent simulation runs. So as this runs, you can get sort of a, an update on all the simulations and actually check out both intermediate results as well as intermediate result quantities. So for instance, um, that pressure difference or the torque on the impeller, these are all available um, as the simulation runs. You can actually also open the post-processor and check out intermediate res global results as well. Now, I've already run this analysis, so let's go ahead to milestone nine and check out some post-processing. Under simulation runs, we'll go ahead and look at the steady state case. And uh, there's a couple items to, to notice here. So running seven simulations and getting results for all of them, it took a total of 14 minutes and only used about 12 core hours. This is a, an incredibly quick turnaround time. Um, if you were using a desktop solution, we, these would run in serial one after another, and it could easily take hours or maybe even days or longer to run these simulations. So we've got this result control node here. And uh, the first thing I'll do is take a look at the force plot and understand forces and moments. Just one item to notice here, if we see the uh, Cartesian coordinate system in view cube in the lower right corner, I'm mostly interested in the moment about the z-axis. That's, that's torque for me, so that's what I care about. So here we're actually showing you um, on the x-axis for the flow rate, um, we're showing you the force on the, um, uh, on the impeller. So this trend, there isn't really a um, extremely specific trend we'll see here. There usually will be different power, uh, uh, shaft powers at, at different operating points. Let's go ahead and um, hide some of these. So I mostly care about the, um, let's say, pressure moment about the Z. And we can really see here, pretty much as expected, as the flow rate increases, the uh, torque on the impeller um, gets lower. So really, uh, the far left condition is almost like a stall condition. It's not, we did allow some flow rate. However, the flow rate is very low. The, the shaft power, the impeller is working hard. So there is a high, um, high amount of torque. The opposite um, over on the far right side, we are not at a, a free flow condition where there's zero head sort of uh, um, resistance on the pump. However, the resistance is quite low and therefore we're getting um, uh, a, um, a uh, smaller um, torque value. So let's go ahead and take a look at the area averages. I'll start with the uh, pressure difference. And this is exactly what we like to see and, and expect to see here. So again, the pressure delta is always highest at the uh, near stall um, condition. And as we get closer to a full, full flow rate, um, your delta decreases. So just to go over this, I mean, on the y-axis, we have a pressure delta of, um, yeah, we're, we're using Pascal's. On the x-axis is, is flow rate, and it's just the table we filled out. We can drill down into any individual run. So for instance, we can look at run one, uh, go ahead, see a, a force plot. And now this is a tiny bit different. Here we're actually uh, looking, the x-axis is actually iterations. Um, so for instance, here we can look at the pressure moment, that's just the torque value. Now we're looking at, this is, uh, this is actually Newton meters. So I usually can, you can use this as a convergence criteria. Um, and we pretty much see after, say, just a couple hundred iterations, really the solution is not changing. There's a bit of numerical noise here. That's always expecting, expected with uh, rotating geometry uh, applications. Lastly, we do automatically develop power or write out power as well. This is just um, your uh, rotating velocity times uh, torque. And the units are, are watts. So let's go to simulation run, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, solution field, and we can do some visualization together.
So we sort of default to uh, having a cutting plane in here, and we're looking at velocity. I'd say probably, um, let's go ahead and toggle off the cutting plane. And I actually like to look at, at pr global pressure here. So under parts color, or actually you can even do it at the bottom here, let's go ahead and select pressure. This is pretty much what I would expect to see. So it again sort of passes a sanity check. We're seeing a low pressure at the inlet here. And as we head towards the outlet, um, we, we see a higher pressure. Now, one item that you may ask about is I'm, I'm probing the inlet and uh, I thought I defined the pressure as, as uh, zero. Well, we're actually showing you static pressure here and the boundary condition we used is uh, zero total pressure. So this is actually the minus, or roughly 4,252 uh, is the dynamic pressure term, uh, which is why you're, you're seeing this here. So sort of if we use a top view, this um, is very characteristic of a standard um, pump result. We see a low pressure at the inlet. As we head towards the outlet, we see that, that high value here. Um, ultimately getting about, I think that's 220,000 pascals at the outlet. Let's go back um, to the cutting plane and, and do some more visualization. I'm actually going to use a solid color on the uh, on the solution here. I'm fine with a, a white, but let's make it transparent. Um, or maybe we'll go with a gray. And I want to actually look at the cutting plane in the Z normal. And we have to toggle this back on. So from here, I actually would like to drop this cutting plane to a point where I can see the blade geometry and understand what's going on. And here, I just need to use the slider bar um, to put it in a place that which makes sense. I think this is great. Let's go ahead and select the clip model. This gets rid of everything below or above the cutting plane. Here, I got rid of everything uh, below it. For the orientation, I'm just going to flip or inverse the cutting plane. And now we're starting to see something that, that looks a bit more interesting here. So we are showing pressure again. Um, pretty much seeing the same trend as below, low pressure in the center, high pressure at the outlet. But let's go ahead and flip to velocity magnitude. So um, here there's a couple items which, which are pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So the maximum velocities are really seen at, at this blade geometry near, um, near really where the, the volute has the flow at exit. Um, if you see, although this does look quite characteristic of a, um, of a pump simulation, if you see some items here, which may, 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 maybe you're not so sure about. So for instance, maybe the high velocity at the middle of the blade, where usually you might expect it to be at the end of the blade, that could be a case where it might make sense to run the analysis as a, as a transient analysis to, to see what's going on. But for now, Let's go ahead, I, I kind of like this, um, this view here. We can actually save the camera angle in the lower right corner to get this exact view across all of our other simulation runs here. Now, if you would like to download a, a screenshot to maybe put in a report, you can actually take a, a screenshot here, define the resolution yourself, get, give it a name, we'll say uh, velocity, uh, Z plane and go ahead and select take screenshot. Um, additionally, there's a lot of other visualization calculators here. However, I think that's mostly what I wanted to show in terms of um, visualization. Steve, would it make sense to jump to some Q and A? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you for that, Matt. That was, uh, that was brilliant. And uh, I'm glad we caught the access when we did so that we could have some following along with the uh, post-processing. That is the uh, most fun part at the end of the day anyway. Okay, so um, one relevant question that we've got actually is um, how long is my access for this project going to last? So, um, Kanchan, would you like to take that question? Hi, uh, so yes, you are going to have access to the professional trial as well as the project for about another four to five days. Uh, 
roughly by around Monday is when we would be deactivating your uh, uh, professional license. Does that answer the question? Perfect, thank you. Um, so another question we've got here um, is, um, I'm planning to start a project in fluid dynamics and mechanical engineering, and I would like to know when one starts their projects, do they automatically become available to the public? Is there a way of preventing this and the intellectual property? And finally, can I do a multi-system project on SimScale? So, um, of course, yes, you can limit the access to your project. If you're using a community account, the free account, then everything that you create in SimScale will automatically be made public. If you need to do uh, your own simulations with intellectual property, then you need a, a professional account, a paid account of SimScale. So you should definitely speak uh, with us. Um, you can email Matt or myself directly um, or access simscale.com uh, forward slash pricing to see the pricing and speak to our sales team. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. You can protect all your intellectual property with a paid version of SimScale. Okay, so um, another uh, technical question here for you, Matt. Um, someone has asked what the typical runtime is for a transient simulation. Sure. So the uh, project I showed you that does four revol revol revolutions, that actually runs in about a couple hours. So it's relatively quick considering um, it's a transient analysis um, with a lot of time steps. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, another technical question for you here, uh, coming from someone. Uh, it says, I couldn't help but noticing that the K epsilon turbulence model has been used. Since we're representing the flow and the volute and through the blades, could the K omega model be used instead? Yeah, that's a good question, especially because the uh, K omega SST is, is sort of industry standard. So it's important to note that our uh, K epsilon turbulence model is not a, a, a default um, sort of publicly available or, or, or the traditional um, turbulence model. It's actually proprietary and we've tailored it specifically over a, a long, long time to rotating machinery. So it's very good at capturing uh, separation and accurately predicting um, separation and just pressure drop across systems and in, in physics. So um, you'll notice, I mean, we have achieved extremely high levels of accuracy compared to experimental data with this turbulence model. So we find it, it suits these applications fine. Excellent, thanks Matt. Um, there's another question, which I think is uh, more of a compliment to Matt and Kanchan. It says, can we hire Kanchan and Matt? Um, you can't hire them directly. They're extremely valuable to us here at SimScale, but you can definitely get their help. Um, if you contact our sales team, uh, we can talk to you about what you want to do with SimScale, and you can get professional level assistance with your projects from engineers like Matt and Kanchan at SimScale. Okay, another technical question, Matt, is how can we export the results to a post-processor such as Paraview? Sure. Um, so for this analysis type, we actually uh, don't support automatically exporting the results. Why that is, is we actually are, are using a, a proprietary data format, which which is not compatible with Paraview. Now, that being said, we are working, and I guess... Um, we could have maybe Kanchan add a little bit, but we are working on making uh, a file format which is supported with 3D uh, third-party post-processors because uh, we know folks might want to download at some point. Uh, yeah, yes, I'd, I'd agree with Matt uh, that we are working on it, but uh, what I would like to draw your attention to is that our post-processor is quite uh, advanced and we are also working on adding more capabilities to our own post-processor like custom calculator and uh, result comparisons. 
So you should be uh, able to do a lot of things that you can do uh, in third-party tools within SimScale itself. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, we've had a lot come in, so I apologize if we haven't got round to answering all of your questions. Um, if you have got further questions that haven't been answered, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, you can email Matt or Kanchan directly um, or contact us through the website. So another question here for you, Matt, is, how can I control the number of cores used to solve uh, and the mesh size? The transient solutions are more shorter than static solutions. I'm not sure what that last statement means, um, but certainly around the cores and the mesh size. Sure, so with SimScale, we're trying to make a, a fully automated um, solution, which is from CAD import to visualization, very easy to use. You'll notice I didn't choose the number of cores or, or really go over um, any meshing uh, refinements or, or defaults. So in the simulation tree, we do have a section uh, noted mesh settings, and we have an automatic mesher in which you can uh, use a slider to um, move the uh, move up or coarsen or fine uh, make this the mesh finer. Uh, that being said, I usually stick to the default and maybe run one simulation or, or two with a bit more refinement. Now, based on the mesh size, we actually choose an instance for you, which will get you a simulation as fast as possible. So we have um, uh, each simulation has access um, up to uh, 96 core machines. However, just because you have access to that computing power doesn't mean um, it, it makes sense or will get you a faster answer to to run it on that machine. So we pretty much look at the cell count, choose the instance that will get you a simulation as fast as possible, and then automatically make that selection for you. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that's all the question time we've got for questions. Um, Kanchan, is there any closing comments that you want to make? Um. I just wanted to say thank you all for joining us today and uh, you have the pro trial with you for a couple of more days and should you have any questions as Steve said please feel free to reach out to me or Matt or to anybody in the SimScale team and should you want to extend your trial please get in touch with our sales team we'd be happy to help you hope you have fun simulating thank you thanks a lot folks